welcome everybody. Thanks for coming. This is both a challenging and exciting time for us at Gray Area because clearly we're responding to this. Um, you know, it turns out we have a 800 person capacity theater space in the mission that we can't use. And so like everyone, we're trying to figure out new ways to connect with everyone. And, um, but it also allows us to expand our audience and kind of do some things we wouldn't have had time for anyway. And one of these is me actually getting to read all these books that I have behind me <laughs> for some reason. Um, and so we wanted to sort of do something where we um, explored some of these earlier sort of histories of media art and theory and the role of technology in society um, and relate it back to sort of our contemporary moment because clearly we're in this place where um, we have a, you know, more than two, but I mean, at least two major competing planetary existential crises being climate and um, now a pandemic sort of happening simultaneously. Um, and we're all locked at home and so we're paying a lot of attention, attention to this uh, sort of electronic global nervous system of mankind that um, we built for ourselves. And so it seemed like a good time to restart with expanded cinema, um, of which the 50th anniversary re-release was just uh, released. Um, if you don't have that uh, version of the book, um, please try and pick it up because um, although we're going to save it for the last session uh, because um, it's a sort of a recontextualization by Gene and we can talk about uh, the introduction a little bit, but um, of a lot of the earlier topics in the book, we're gonna save that section for last. Um, so you still have time to sort of uh, grab that copy so you have that new material for the end. Um, we have, you know, uh, our platform at Gray Area, we've named Patch. Um, it's where we're putting all of our online content. That's at patch.grayarea.org. If you all haven't seen it, everybody on the call has probably seen it, but if you're watching from uh, our terrestrial audience beyond the Zoom chat. Um, and we also have a chat room on a platform called uh, Riot that's at chat.grayarea.org that you can sign up for. And that's where we're, it's our sort of federated open source chat server um, where we're gathering all this community dialogue. Um, so I think that's all the sort of housekeeping stuff I have to say. We're generally going to have that chat going on all the time. And then we'll have a kind of weekly um, uh, discussion with Gene and hopefully not always me. I'm setting up some uh, more folks to um, and a lot of people from more contemporary sort of expanded cinema uh, professions, AR, XR, VR uh, thinkers to be in conversation with Gene and um, help to kind of recontextualize this historical material. Uh, so that all being said, the 50th anniversary edition of the book was just released. Um, and if you all haven't seen the conversation uh, with Gene and the um, and Michael Connor, the executive director of Rhizome, uh, that happened, I don't know, a week, two weeks, week, two weeks ago, um, we'll post the link to that conversation in the uh, chat. Um, and maybe update the web page as well uh, with the link to that because I think it's as good a place as any to start um, thinking about that and the conversation uh, talk Gene gave at Gray Area Festival a few years ago um, thinking about these book topics but I believe that there are a couple of things Gene you want to uh, recover from the from the rhizome talk Yes. <clears throat> yeah. Uh, first of all, hello, everybody. This is great. We're really, really delighted to do this. And for the hundredth time, and I would do it 200 times, I want to thank everybody, uh, Barry and, and Michael, for doing this. This is terrific. And I'm going to enjoy this a lot. I want to learn from you people. And uh, so we'll do it. Um, there were 
three things that I wanted to sort of address before we, we, before we start a conversation today, uh, coming from the, uh, the rhizome uh, thing. Uh, and, and by the way, um, uh, Expanded Cinema 50 is published by Fordham University Press. And the, you just do uh, FordhamPress.edu. The dot minute, com. what? Dot com. No, dot edu. Oh. And, <laughs> and uh, where was I? FordhamPress.edu, the minute their homepage comes up, the video of my conversation with Michael Connor comes immediately on. You don't even have to click it. It's just on. Uh, so what I, would, I suggest that you do is pause it go to where you buy the book and buy the book. Then go back <laughs> to our conversation. The reason I say that, obviously, this is a, uh, this is a history book now. It used to be about the future, now it's about the past, although some people think otherwise. Um, and it really, it, it, we think of this being used in media arts history courses. That's what it's for. And there's a lot of people out there. And I think it's true that, uh, that it does uh, fill in gaps in that history. And so anybody who's in those courses, teaches those courses, would like to be, it really does need to, to be there as a, as a historical uh, statement. So anyhow, that's that, and then you go, <laughs> you go back and watch me and Michael talk. <clears throat> During that talk with Michael, one of the callers caught me totally by surprise, and I said something I, I really, it was just dumb. What did I think? We were talking about um, media criticism and who were, the, who were the heavyweights. And somebody asked about Neil Postman. Neil Postman wrote a book called Amusing Ourselves to Death. It came out the same year as Expanded Cinema. It's 50 years old, right? You've heard this phrase, um, <clears throat> been there, done that. I hate that phrase. It's like arrogant, it probably comes from people that haven't done anything. But it's my excuse here. I haven't thought about those media criticism books for a long time, because it was a time in which that's all I ever did think about. And I, so, I've, so I've been there, done that, and it's just is never in my mind. And all of a sudden, out of the blue, comes this question about Neil Postman. At first, I couldn't even remember who he was. And then, I, and then I, what did I think of him? And I said, well, you know, he's not really a heavy hitter. I don't really care about that guy. Afterwards. I thought, what the hell did I say? You know, it's crazy. So I looked over in my media shelf. I find Neil Postman. I find this. I don't know if you can see this. And what do I find? Dog-eared all over the place. Highlights all over the place. Of course there would be. The, <clears throat> and, and, and what is that book? It was, this, it was the distinction between 1984, George Orwell, and, uh, and uh, Aldous Huxley's Brave New World. And that whole book is based on the contrasting of those two things and making the point, which is now totally understood, and probably because uh, Postman made it, that it's, uh, that it's Huxley and not Orwell that is, that's got the story. I mean, that, that's what happens. It's not, you know, now, meaning, well, okay, I want to, I want to make a point here about Orwell. 1984 is a commercial for totalitarianism. Yes, we have that kind of overt totalitarianism in the world today, obviously, what North Korea, you, whatever, whatever you want to name, where they are. <clears throat> but the point is, everybody knows it. Everybody living it knows it. It's totally blatant. That's a really stupid way to control people. The really smart way is the way it's done, the way the broadcast does it to us all day, every day, all our lives right now. And that's what uh, Postman was, was trying to make, the point he was trying to make. So that's enough of that. I realize that, you know, th this thing we're doing here isn't about media criticism necessarily. And uh, so I thought, okay, I want to make that point. You know, I'm not that stupid. Uh, and, and, then, and then I said, well, he's not a really heavy hitter. Well, what do I mean by that? In other words, there are other, I was suggesting that other media cr critics that are mo more important, so I just quickly want to do this. I said on that thing, 
for me, this is the Bible. I can't see what I'm doing here, but Noam Chomsky's Manufacturing Consent. Manufacturing Consent. How different is that from uh, 1984, huh? Then, that, and that's Noam Chomsky. Then another one, another title here by Chomsky. Necessary Illusions. Necessary. We live in illusion, and he's saying it's necessary. That's the thing to think about. Then I said, well, there are other guys. There's, there's uh, Michael Parenti, make believe media, because they make us believe. Inventing reality, Michael Parenti. Parenti. The social construction of reality, by the way, is like, you're not educated if you haven't read that. Land of idols. Now, I'm, I'm saying that I got, I got about 75 books on the shelf, and I'm just picking these. Another heavy hitter. We're talking about heavy hitters here. R Robert McChesney. Rich Media, Poor Democracy. These are the key books you need to read to be educated about media. Another one is Douglas Kellner, Television and the Crisis of Democracy. We're talking about stuff here that's decades old, folks. Then there's this other guy, <clears throat> Herbert Schiller. You can't see this one very well. Mass Communication and American Empire, okay? And finally, <clears throat> what's this? Oh yeah, McChesney, I already showed you McChesney. Here's another one. The Global Media, The New Missionaries of Corporate Capitalism, Global. Okay, that's a tiny fraction of what I suggest you should read. But before all of them, read Peter Berger and Thomas Luckman, The Social Construction of Reality. That's the statement of, of a life in the world today. I mean, you just can't understand anything without reading that. Hey, okay, Jim, the other thing that- pardon? I have a question about the book list real quick. Yeah. Because something I've been dealing with as I go through this stuff a lot too, and maybe, some other people on the call or chat know some examples as well, but it seems like, well, I mean, or clearly is most of this media theory work and um, that's been published is by men. And I have been looking for books, you know, actively from female authors or even non-white authors too, you know, just a broader cross section of backgrounds from authors. Is there anything just in your mind right now that was sort of antecedent to this or writers that were contemporary that you can um, think? Of? I mean, it, you know. at that time, at that time, as far back as I'm going here, these books, as, as far back as that, there were actually very few. And probably for the sexist reasons that any, uh, you know, aware woman would, would say now. Since then, there's tons. I mean, a lot. <laughs> can I name one? Uh, I wasn't prepared for this question. They, no, they, no, no, okay. I mean, I wasn't expecting a comprehensive list, but I, from the period specifically, I've been looking for more historic antecedents for other, you know, blind spots I had. And I just didn't know if there's anything that came to mind. From the period, from this period, I seriously doubt it that there was one that caught a lot of attention. I, since then, group research eminent, project. Pardon? It's a group research project now. Yeah, well, you don't have to research far. Feminist theory, feminist media theory, there's just, I mean, hundreds. I mean, it's just, just Google that, I guess. You know, feminist me media theory, something like that. There's a ton of them. I haven't followed that because, as I said, <laughs> and now, again, this arrogant thing, been there, done that. I came to a point where I, I said, okay, you, you know enough to say something important about this. Let's move on. And I've moved on to other things, which I'm about to explain. And I've got some of those famous books right up here. It's just too late for me to start pulling them down right now. Um, so, uh, so anyway, that's, that's that. I, that's what I wanted to say about that question about Neil Postman. I was really embarrassed about that. Second thing that happened during, uh, during that, Michael Connor, we know him well. He, we came on, there's Michael, there's us. And we had a bad audio connection. I knew that he was going to say Jane, my wife, and he did. And we, we only heard him because we knew he was going to say that. There was a horrible audio connection. 
And it sounded, and then I said, oh, that phantom in the back there, uh, she takes care of everything. And I didn't say Jane because he already said it. And, and I, some of my women friends call them, Jane, why didn't you introduce Jane? And they go, okay. And so, uh, so two things are going to happen. That uh, thing with Michael Connor is on, it's on uh, the Fordham, right? And we're going to put, we're gonna put a, a, a subtitle on it where he says Jane to prove that I thought he already said it. But anyway, here's Jane. So Jane, come on. Jane's going to come over and sit down. And we've got our story that we want to tell you. So let's see. Wait, see, they can't see us. There we go. It's a little better. OK. We see you. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so this is Jane. I'm gonna, this is important. Our history here is important. We, I was teaching at California Institute of the Arts back in the, when it started, 1970. At a certain point, Jane was there as an older graduate student. We started living together. Uh, and, then, and then we separated, um, but stayed in touch for many years, 26 years, in fact. Can you get more in there? Yeah. And uh, it's, a, it's a good thing that we separated. I was kind of a loose cannon at the time. <laughs> and, uh, poor, poor innocent Jane didn't need to suffer through that. Uh, I was kind of semi-loose. I was kind of tethered, you know, by a bungee cord to something. But uh, we, we separated 26 years, communicated the whole time. Uh, 26 years later, she comes out here to uh, Albuquerque. I said, why don't you move to Santa Fe? Well, hey, why don't you move in with me? Uh, <clears throat> we did. We fell in love again. And Staina Vasulka, we got her a, uh, a minister's license. And Staina married us with a GoPro in her hat and, uh, and his love ever after. Um, Jane uh, is so. And, and now the next thing that I want to explain is really important with regards to the Kit and Sherry book, the Kit Galloway and Sherry Rabinowitz and their work. I had, when I moved out here to Santa Fe from Los Angeles, been working, been living with Kit and Sherry and interviewing them for years about their work to do a book. Did interview them about their whole past. And at that time, they were starting this thing called Electro Electronic Cafe International. It was an international, what they call acculturation laboratory for, to acculturate emerging media technology. And they had these labs, affiliates they call them, all over the world, including Russia. <clears throat> oh, wait a minute, there's something else. Re remember about Brian, okay. Um, <clears throat> anyway, it, it was huge. So at the same time, I'm moving out, out here, starting a full-time job teaching three two-hour courses, no, yeah, three three-hour courses a week, which I hadn't done. In Los Angeles, I was doing the, the adjunct exploitation, you know, have videos, will travel, and going around. Because, you know, all I ever wanted to do was stay home and think. I didn't want to do what Bucky calls proving your right to live, and they call it work, wage slavery. And so the least I could be involved in any institutional stuff, the better it was. So I just put my videos in my bag and drove hundreds of miles around Los Angeles, greater Los Angeles area, doing that stuff. Well, that wasn't working out too well. And so Stana called up one day and said, hey, there's this new college out there in Santa Fe, and they would like to hire you. And I said, I'm coming. I didn't care what it was. Well, <clears throat> Kid and Cherry were calling like every day. Hey, we got this new affiliate in Russia. We got this new affiliate in Italy. Interview them, interview, interview them. I'm capable of driving myself into the ground, uh, Jane knows well, and that's what I did at that time. I collapsed. Uh, I, I thought it was a nervous breakdown. It was that serious. You go to hospital for that stuff. I just couldn't move. And so I went to the doctors and they said, you have nervous exhaustion. You've got to put down what you're, anything you can put down now that, that you can put down, stop it. And what I stopped was the Kid and Sherry book. And I'm taking this opportunity to tell the world, whoever's listening, why this thing did not happen. Kid already knows this, and Michael. <clears throat> and uh, it took me a long time to recover. But when I recovered, I still couldn't like deal with that Kid and Sherry book. Well, I'm a creative person. I, have, I can't live without having some project going on. 
During that time, and this is important to explain what's going on now with me and Jane, I discovered the video diaries of, of the filmmaker George Kuchar. They are not what most people think of when you think of George Kuchar and his twin brother Mike, those Hollywood caricatures and B-movie characters, all that stuff. These are masterpieces. They're, they're in fact, we're claiming that nothing, that he had done the impossible. He's invented a way to have subjectivity in continuity cinema. I won't go into that. This is not the time to do it. But I can assure you this is a major contribution to film theory. Huge. This is a massive book. The man made 232 diaries. We are analyzing them almost frame by frame. 232 diaries. We've been working on it for 15 years. Uh, and we're, we're approaching the end of it this year. So that's why <laughs> the Kid and Cherry book never got finished, because this thing took over. I, I don't like to waste, uh, I shouldn't say it that way. I only really get into things that I think I can make a major fundamental contribution to, or I'm not interested. I'm not interested in, you know, reviewing videos and doing that stuff. So, so that is it. that's why this one is so important. I can actually do that. We're actually doing that. So <clears throat> I just want to make that clear. I hope that cl clears up a lot of questions in people's mind. It was important to me. People understand why I didn't do Kid and Cherry. Are you going away? Okay. Yes. So uh, that's my preface. <laughs> and thanks for listening. What's up next? Well, I think I want to start from earlier on you said this you know book used to be about the future but now it's about the past but i sort of disagree with that a little bit um one of the most phenomenal things about this book to me is how um prescient a lot of the things are and how much a lot of the concepts in this book relate extremely well to our present moment um which is you know, no way to have known that at the time, probably, but I would like to talk a little bit about just the general context of the time um, and um, particularly, you know, this, this uh, we're going to save the new introduction to the end, but the first introduction of the, uh, you know, 1970 edition was from Buckminster Fuller. Um, and I don't, it's a pretty, you know, it's very fuller sort of writing. And so I don't think we want to kind of address that in depth, but uh, Fuller comes up a lot in this uh, first section. So I'm wondering if we can just preface a little bit, maybe around what your relationship with Fuller and maybe any other thinkers at the time, you know, Norbert Wiener, I don't know anyone else that you are thinking of that come up. Um, yeah. That all played into. Right. And some couple important points here. <clears throat> um, you use the word prescient. That documentary, uh, if you if you people were, were watching the conversation with Rizo and Michael Connor, he showed clips from a documentary in which people were saying, Oh, this is so prescient and all that. And of course, I obviously I appreciate that. Those clips come from a documentary that wasn't acknowledged there. And, and I, I don't blame Michael. He couldn't. He had to edit that thing in such a way, you know, to fit into the program we were doing. There's a man named Brian Konevsky. He lives here near us in, in Albuquerque, an hour away. And a long time ago, and I, I forgot to check the years, at least, at least a decade ago, if not more, he said to me, I want to do a, I want to do a portrait of you, something about you, you know, and I want to interview people. Who should I interview? I gave him a list of 40 people around the world, including Russia, all over the place. I set the interviews up for him. I, I contacted him. This guy's doing this. He wants to ask you questions. And he put a year in a traveling around the world and made these incredible interviews. They're, I'm so grateful for that. They're, they're fantastic. One reason, somebody like Michael Conner could come along, re-edit him, and make, make that interesting uh, presentation that he did. Problem there is that uh, Brian wasn't uh, credited. And that's not Michael's fault. So right now, I just want to credit Brian and say that he's the source of those, uh, of those clips, okay? Uh, back to Bucky. 
Um, why am I talking about Bucky now? I hadn't thought about Bucky really for, I don't know, 20 years. But all of a sudden, here comes this thing, this book, and he's going to be in it. And it's about the past. It's about those days. So, I, you know, I have to, like, talk about that. I just want to make clear that everything I'm saying about it is, is sincere and all that. But again, I moved on. You know, that's it's another time in my life. If you were with me these days, I probably would maybe never talk about Buggy, just because it's my past and I live here, be here now. So, but, but Bucky, <clears throat> um, in, the, uh, in the introduction to EC50, as I call it, there are some quotes from Buggy. I'd like to read them to you. Nation states are blood clots in planetary metabolism. What's he saying about nation states? I call that radicals. I call that a radical statement. Working is proving your right to live. Wage slavery. The birth certificate is the only credit card. Everyone is born a genius, but the process of living degeniuses us. There is no energy crisis, only a crisis of ignorance. I want to on that one forget there is no energy crisis and just say there's a crisis of ignorance. Let me get back to that. You either make sense or you make money. And then finally, quote, reality should always be in quotes. I forgot one that I regret that I didn't put in there. Uh, <laughs> no, I forgot. Um, yeah, the last one is dare to be naive. So I want to connect that to something. Uh, M Michael Connor brought it up in the in the rhizome. He was saying uh, something about, well, you know, sometimes we think of how we were back there in those hippie days, you know, that kind of naive. I think Barry, you even brought it up earlier today about attitudes about those things. Um, Bucky said, dare to me, be naive. To, if, I, if someone said to me, hey, Gene, you were so naive back then, you know, how could you have expected this and that? My, my response to that is, yeah, we're naive. Why? It's because we're supposed to be naive. For social control, it's absolutely essential. That, that the politically significant uh, section of the population must be naive. What is naivete? It's not a desire. No desire is ever naive. Only expectations are naive. So I beg you, if you're on the right side of history and you love people, never accuse anyone of being naive unless there's a really strong reason to do it. Like, what would that be? Oh, everyone around that person knows it except them. You know, okay, that's naive. But that's not the case, you know. A lot of people, millions of people, hundreds of thousands of people live through certain times of history. They embody it, they enact it. Their desires, fears, and all that stuff are part of it. You don't call those people naive. That's buying, right, that's buying into our oppression. Never do that. It's a total insult. Hey, yeah, I admit to it, I'm naive, okay? Uh, and Bucky says, dare to be naive. That statement, so, so take those statements. Nation states are blood clots and planetary, and that, he's against nation states. I call that radical, yeah. I call the man a utopian radical. Working is proving your right to live, come on. He's talking wage slavery here. He's talking Marx. Birth certificate is the only credit card. Well, that's an interesting metaphor, you know? Makes you think. What if we lived in a world in which that was understood? Everyone's born a genius, but the process of living degeniuses us. Is that not the case? Come on. We're supposed to be naive. The, the majority of the population must not think critically. This is, everyone knows that. And so Becky calls it degeniusing. Then there's no energy crisis, only a crisis of ignorance. Drop the energy thing crisis of ignorance. We are supposed to be ignorant to a certain degree. That is, these things are imperatives of social control. You cannot have a mass population thinking critically. You've got to be ignorant in a politically relevant scale. 
And you either make sense or make money. That doesn't need an explanation. And reality should always be in quotes. Well, we just looked at tons of books. And their whole, the whole fundamental point of all those media books that I just showed you, that's their message. <laughs> reality is a social construction. In fact, everything we know is a social construction, including ourselves. <clears throat> Bucky, I want this final thing then. <clears throat> uh, I can show you an old video when I, I introduced him somewhere. <clears throat> and uh, I couldn't think, I said to the audience, you know, everything has been said about this man. I don't know what to say about this man, except that he's an ethical person. So here I'd like to introduce you to Bucky Fuller, an ethical person. He comes on. And he did this thing that Bucky always did. He put his hands together like this, as in prayer. This is what he did. He, the man was incredibly uh, charismatic. He closes his eyes. He's got these like half inch thick glasses. You know, his eyes are that big. He closes, he puts his hands together and he thinks like this. And there's silence. And then he starts talking. Well, <clears throat> I loved it. <laughs> we all loved it. But think of how many gurus kind of behave that way, you know? Uh, and yes, that was part of Bucky's presentation. You know, that's who he was. Uh, there are criticisms about it. The more that, you know, that kind of thing, the way he was, his charisma. People who want to criticize him jump right on that stuff. Uh, so, I, you know, I admit it. Yes, so what? <laughs> I, he gave us more than anybody I can think of at the time, you know, and I don't care what you call him or how he behaved. If anyone is interested, I have one final little uh, story, a little personal story about that, that is stuck in my mind. They brought me out to Carbondale to talk to the world game people. And then Bucky. It's where I grew uh, up, by the way. Oh, really? Carbondale, yeah. Wow. Relatedly. <laughs> yeah, Carbondale. It does have storms. Um, but uh, where was I? Oh, oh, yeah. So uh, that evening, one of those evenings, Bucky uh, uh, took me to his home with his wife, Anne, uh, to have dinner. He lived at, uh, where do you think he lived? In a, in, a, in a geodesic dome. But it was really humble. You know, this little small thing. He really, but he wasn't into like owning stuff except for his yacht intuition. That's, that's where he splurged. But let's get back to this dome. So there we are having dinner and we're talking intense, 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 you know, and, and Anne, you know, when Bucky, when Bucky or anyone else, and especially Bucky and me get together, no one else can talk. It's just con it's constant, da, 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 da. So she said, goodbye, I'm going to sleep. <clears throat> A storm came, electric, those, those Midwest electrical storms of which George Kuchar documents incredibly in his diaries, but anyway. Um, and so there, there are skylights on the, on top of this dome. So you're boom and a flashing of the lights. And, and here's Bucky in his, in, in his real mode, you know, he's really pouring it on and I'm sitting there listening to this stuff. Like, I, you know, I thought I died and went to heaven. This was, this, this was so dramatic, I couldn't believe it. And the lightning is going more and he's telling about how to save the world and world game and all this stuff. And I was there really naive. And then at 3 a.m. with hailstones falling all over the place and lightning striking everywhere. He gets in his car and drives me to my motel at 3 a.m. So just something that stuck in my mind. So shall we move on? Uh, what, what? Yeah, sure, let's move on. Yeah. Um, let's see. So I think one of the, there are a couple of things I want to talk about just to set up the first um, section. One is, I kind of, one of the first terms you run into in the book is this uh, paleo-cybernetic, um, which, and I'll just read the definition for it. I mean, it's in the preface. It's like the first thing you run into. Um, combining the primitive potential associated with the paleolithic and the transcendental integrities of practical utopianism, in quotes, associated with the cybernetic. Um, and... I don't know. I just want to talk about how you feel about that term now, if it still holds up, if um, what it what it means recontextualized to today. Um, if you would have coined something else now, I don't know. Right. Uh, two responses. 
the um, widespread use, almost to the point of cliche, I guess it even is a cliche, of this term paleo. You know, you've got paleo cookbooks, paleo dog food, I don't know. Th that didn't exist back then. D you know, it just simply did not exist. So, so forget this context. Second point, <clears throat> the, my introduction to EC50 starts, says, the book was written by a 26-year-old former crime reporter with only a high school education. You could take that in two ways, <laughs> that I'm bragging, how could such a person be so smart? Or the real thing, the real reason I said it is, folks, that's who I was, you know, don't expect too much from me. I, obviously, if you have only a high school education from those kinds of high schools, the 1950s, you got nothing. So how could that guy do this? Well, of course, I tried to educate myself. Well, to edu that's fine, you can do that, and many people do it, and I loved it, I'm still doing it every second of the day. But uh, <clears throat> uh, you need a guide. You can't just like randomly just grab a book here and there, which was what I was doing. I didn't have a guide, <clears throat> but I was uh, really looking around. I, I intuited there was something to say, and I had no language, no background, no history, nothing. So that's why I started that book that way. <clears throat> and, and to cover my ass and say, sure, there's a lot of dumb stuff in there, and I wouldn't defend a lot of it, because that's who I was. Um, <clears throat> so paleo, I don't know where I got that paleo, but I, I wanted to say, hey, this is a book about things that are dawning on the world. They're coming. The, you know, this is nascent. This is a birth of something. This stuff is going to you know, you're going to think this stuff is so cool and so future and so, you know, high tech and all this. And I, I, I wanted to say, yeah, that's where we are now. But, you know, that's what this now is about five seconds. And here comes the rest of history. And we are in the paleo stage. So that's that's, you know, that's why I tried to make that point. Uh, and let me go to another. Uh, you can ask more, but I, I want to there's something connected to that. Are you? <laughs> I use the phrase new sphere, right? N-O-O-S-P-H-E-R-E. Tilar de Chardin, a, uh, I believe is a Catholic uh, philosopher in France. I'm not quite sure. He's a Jesuit, yeah. Jesuit, yeah. <clears throat> well, I don't know. I stumbled across this thing. And it was this idea of the world mind, right? This collective world mind. Well, first of all, let's jump to right now. There is kind of such a thing now, but that needs to be highly qualified. <clears throat> but back in those days, it, it was clearly something that if you took seriously the emerging technologies, some kind of global mind connection, the phenomenon of man, hey, hey, you got it, cool. TLR de Shadan, right. Okay, I don't know how I, I found that, I did. <clears throat> and, uh, and that, again, was kind of slightly ambient. You know, people were kind of wanting to think about that. And we all thought it was cool. Oh, wouldn't that be great, a one world mind? <clears throat> huh. Well, look at today. The last thing I, I think, the last thing we want is a one world mind. Think about it, how oppressive that would be. So talk about naive. But again, naive is, is a desire the desire to be together in this case, to come together somehow. And this was coming out of a, the, the time of counterculture where you had this counterculture community who were really together. They were constructing a certain reality. And then you had everything else, everything else that I used to, used to be before I dropped out. And so, yeah, the, the idea of a, of a collective mind was really kind of appealing to us because in one sense, on a small scale, and very briefly, there was this kind of mind connection, if you will, I don't know what to call it. And it was kind of worldwide, you know? And it didn't last long. It could never have last long. We were naive to even imagine that it possibly could. 
And so that, that interest in the one world mind came out of that gestalt, you know, that situation, counterculture, drop out, all that stuff. And I didn't know anything. You know, I was like, well, who's talking about world mind? So I find this guy, Chardin, and uh, <clears throat> use him, <laughs> new sphere. I didn't like that word. I think it's a goofy word, new sphere. Uh, sounds like ice cream or something. I don't know. But, uh, but so that's, that's that. So, so those two concepts, paleo, whatever you want to call it, and new sphere, uh, were the only things I knew how to, through language, reach toward what I knew was the, the, the zeitgeist, the, what we were desiring, you know. And so that's, you know, that's just, that's why they're there. And I'd be the first one to drop them in, at the drop of a hat if someone could, you know, give me what something. About the, uh, what about the cybernetic half of it? Because one of the interesting things now, I think, is that a lot of the cybernetics in general have come back into vogue a little bit um, in a lot of younger people kind of going back and uh, uh, it's uh, for some for some reason it's trending right now as a kind of topic to re-explore um, and I don't know if you have any thoughts about that or and I might, might have to unmute Bruce here too because we also have the uh, world expert on second order cybernetics on the zoom call with us and maybe you know I don't know how we can go into as long as we want right now but um, yeah I'd love to respond to this yeah, yeah sure yeah and uh well, hey, this is the moment for me to thank Bruce. In the introduction to EC50, I acknowledge that it was, it was Bruce Clark, he, Bruno Clark, as everybody knows him. Um, he, he, he got this idea. This came out of the blue. To me. I didn't solicit this. I got a phone call from Fordham Unit, Unit Press that would like to do expanded cinema. This guy, Bruce Clark, says we should do it, you know. It just blew me away. I could, I didn't even read the book for 20 years. And so I really, I mean, I owe the existence of this thing to Bruce Clark. And the second thing, there came a time in my life where I, I, I was intellectually attracted to uh, second order systems thinking and theory. It's really intellectually satisfying to me. I, and I just was obsessed with it. And in the introduction, uh, there's a whole story about that of Heinz von Forster and and Umberto Maturana and Francisco Varela and all that. <clears throat> um, and so getting now back on cyber, <clears throat> um, you know, cybernetics, uh, I think it's uh, when Norbert Wiener is uh, communication and control in animals and machines or something like that, right? Well, it's very specific. I, I probably have it wrong, but communication and control in animals and machines, something like that. And it was nothing cosmic. You know, is how do things operate and have purpose and move forward? Here we go. Can't can't read that. Yeah. Uh, yeah. C control and communication in the animal machine. Okay, great. Um, well, that that's pretty. Uh, hey, Bruce, how are you? Uh, I'm hearing I'm hearing heavy feedback here. Um, and so, where was I? So yeah, so Norbert Wiener's first order systems uh, cybernetic theory was that book that you just saw. Of course, it took over the world. Why not? I mean, it was incredibly important. That, that's a foundational thing, you know, in all our lives and all society now, still. That's how things work. You couldn't ignore them, you know? I mean, it, it claimed to be like awake. And so, uh, and so, there was that word that he introduced, Kubernetes, the steersman. And we were thinking, oh, steersman. Oh, well, hey, we got to steer this train in a different direction. And we're at the paleo stage of cybernetics here. So I let paleo cybernetic, it seemed. And it was obviously clear that it being first, just now starting, it had this infinite future. It had to be paleo. A, how else would you even think about it, you know? So, uh, so, and then uh, you asked about today and all this. In, the, uh, <clears throat> in my talk with, uh, with Rice on the other day with Michael, he pointed out to me, see, I, one thing that I really regret today is that I don't have contact with the younger generation. I taught for 38 years and I really miss the young people and especially young people today. If I think of us 
back in the 60s, Vietnam, and all that, everything around it, and the counterculture. What we young people were faced with is utterly insignificant to the kind of world today's young people. I can't even imagine what's in the hearts and minds and souls of young people today. And I would love to be able to imagine it. I really miss that contact. And so when Michael said the other day that this word cyber was, uh, had gone out of vogue, but then some people are now bringing it back into vogue and they mentioned certain people. And then I, then I had a kind of a smart ass response. You know, I said, oh, cyber, cyber, cyber. What the hell does that mean? I don't care what you call it. Well, that's true. I really don't. Uh, and I said something, I probably said something smart ass like, uh, Oh, cyber, if you say it's cyber, it's supposed to be special or something like that. Yes. You know, we live in a society where things like that are taken and used in those ways. And you, you try to be cool by saying the reason, you know, the cool words. That's all true. We know that. But I'm not trying to put that down. It's, uh, and so I'm just saying, what does cyber, the way Wiener defined it, it's pretty kind of, you can even say kind of dry and kind of like unambiguous and kind of lacking a certain depth that I think because of second order theory, that depth is there now, you know, way deeper than what Norbert Wiener, and there's, it's not his fault. You know, he was a major thinker and a breakthrough. You don't want to minimize that whatsoever. So anyhow, when, uh, when Michael brought that up the other day, I had to say, you know, I, I, really, I didn't know that. I, it went out of favor, really? I, okay, I don't care. It's fine with me, you know. I don't need it. I just, I, I just want revolution. However you get it, fine, you know. Um, but let me just say, Bruce Clark, in addition to making this book happen, has been so beautiful to talk with this man. He has taught me so much about second order theory. And you guys, I know it's, I don't know, a lot of you might not care less about this, but if you are, if you like to think about serious stuff that have a lot of meat, a lot of depth, I suggest second order theory. You, uh, you should not tackle Niklas Luhmann uh, by yourself. I need Bruce to even like pronounce the guy's name. But, uh, but it, if you are, I'll say it, an intellectual and you're drawn to this kind of thinking, there is nothing more exciting in my mind these days than second order systems theory, and especially as applied to social systems by this incredible German sociologist, Niklas Luhmann. Um, <clears throat> let me tell you just one thing this guy said to just knock me out. Bruce, I read this the other day and I just laughed out loud. He wrote a book called, uh, 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 he, he writes books about social subsystems as systems, you know, so the art world as a system, right? Uh, and it's got one, media, the media as a system. Uh, he, say, he says something like this, you know, we think, well, forget what he said, Here, here's about it. We, we watch television, let's say you're, you're watching live television, television or live uh, streaming on, on the internet, you know. And you think, well, I'm directly, I'm directly experiencing this reality, right? How could you not? This is direct, it's real time, video is capturing reality. And, and, uh, and Luhmann says, not quite in this way. What you are seeing, yes, you're seeing it as some kind of thing we call real time, yes. But there's something called a frame around that. And that frame exists in a, a context larger than that frame. And we read that. We don't know we're reading it in a certain way, but we are. And so Lumen says, you don't know anything. You've just heard tell of it. I just fell on the floor laughing. I'm going to use that to death. You know, every time I talk about the media, I'm just going to say, hey, we heard tell of it. You know, that, that's... If, if you insert that kind of language into those books I just showed you, Chomsky and all those heavy, the old polls, as they say, the old politics, and I'm going to pump this new language into there, and it's going to give me a lot of laughs. I really enjoy that. So uh, I'm rambling on. Uh, yes, Bruce. Can't hear you. 
Can't hear you. Wait. No. Let me try and I see you muted there. Let me see if I can unmute. All right. There we go. Can you hear me now? Oh, I hear yeah, you. yeah. Hi, Bruce. Hey, Gene. That thanks so much for those lovely words. Uh, I uh, uh, if it's okay, I'd like to take you back before second order cybernetics, uh, just my observation is that Wiener, nowadays, Norbert Wiener, I mean, people have heard of him, but they probably haven't read him uh, to the extent that they may have read Bucky Fuller. But I think the two of them dovetail, and, and, and in your naivete, <laughs> as a young thinker at that moment, there's a crossover between at least, I, I, let me see if you would agree with this. Bucky talks about entropy uh, very significantly as part of his vision for uh, a smarter world, a more informed world. And, and Wiener provides this vocabulary that you work with in the chapter that we read for today, that is in the, the first chapter that's under discussion at the moment, where the concepts of entropy and in, energy, entropy and information are all kind of lined up as a cluster by which to think about what communication is all about and what art is for. <laughs> which is to perform this neg entropic uh, act uh, of expression. Uh, and, and you captured that uh, so powerfully in your evocation of art as essentially the, the, the way to live a creative life. The creative life was the life for which living was making art from moment to moment. And, and the, the, the terms for that countercultural vision of what the world, of the kind of world that we could make for ourselves, that's what you can kind of find in, if you go back also to the human use of human beings, which was Wiener's popular volume, possibly a little more accessible than, right. uh, than, than the, uh, the cybernetics volume that, uh, yeah, that Barry showed us. Uh, does that spur any, does that sound right to you? Absolutely, absolutely. And just to add, and thank you for that. See, Bruce is so cool. He just, I, I love it. Uh, the, uh, the, just to add to that, we're always looking for new language, right? We're always looking for a way to say stuff that resonates with our time, with our zeitgeist, with our hearts and minds now. It's not that it's not that uh, Wiener and that whole cybernetics thing were saying something, you know, absolutely out of the blue, totally, totally unprecedented in any human's mind. They were just giving more precision, another way to talk. You, you can talk differently and, and dissociate yourself from the old discourse, you know. And we all do that. Every at every moment in history, aren't we all looking for a new way to say stuff? Well, yes, and now we've got second order. That's a new way to, that's why I got onto them. It was a new way to say stuff. Bruce, you, I asked you once, uh, well, what, what does this really contribute? I kind of know, you know, intuitively we know these things. And Bruce says, you've got precision. And it's, it's real serious precision that this way of talking and thinking uh, gives. And I love it. Not, not to, you know, not to mention just the, sheer satisfaction of swimming in these deep intellectual waters you know it's really cool uh yeah so that's all i would add to that cool yeah bruce we're going to bring you back sometime and dig into this more i would also say in uh in terms of our first the sort of first question about uh female antecedents we uh, this brings up lynn margulis so we should probably you know tie yeah. that in at some point in our yeah. in our next week's discussion. Uh, let me just say it's about that uh, women. Any serious feminist 
for the last decades who does not address media is just not a serious feminist. So I'm just saying they have. There's no doubt about it. They all have. So just to add that, I can't hear you uh, now. Is it our fault? I don't think so. <laughs> can't hear you. Can you hear me? Wait, Nod your head. No, that was there you fault. go. I, I can hear you again. All right, absolutely. That was my fault. Um, so one last thing I think I'd like to bring up just to preface the first chapter and then maybe if anybody has some questions from the from the audience, we can filter some in. If you have them to say on the chat, um, we'll get them asked. Um, and that's one of my favorite topics, which is why art? Um, when we're at a sort of these crisis moments where things to be seem to be broken on a very su sort of like subsistence level, you know, like we, we don't have enough masks, like people are dying, that sort of thing. Um, it's very easy to start to think of things like art and artists, especially if you're an artist, you're like, what do I do? How I do like, what is my role in this situation? Um, and this first section of the book says, I mean, I think some extremely spot on things about what the role of art is and that versus entertainment. I mean, it's the whole, what the whole first section is about. So I don't know if you have any thoughts about that right now. You mean art and the situation that we're in? Art and the situation, yeah, yeah. Whoa. Important. Like why, why, if you're an artist right now and you're sitting around going like feeling sort of like useless because you're an artist <laughs> and you're, you're, you're staring down the barrel of like millions of deaths and like the political situation, you know, the earth's dying, all this sort of stuff. Like, I think it's important for us to make some sort of recommitment of why this is actually one of the most crucial things you can possibly be doing. I agree. Uh, let me just uh, go back, uh, step back a little bit. Um, what we, I, and I don't think this is unique at all. I'm sure hundreds of people are saying this. We're, we're looking at high level Greek tragedy here. We're looking at Shakespearean tragedy, Greek mythology. We are, I mean, that's not an empty metaphor. Anybody who's awake now feels that and knows it. It's breathtaking. And you know, I, I'm not surprised that we're all just totally obsessed with it. My own personal, well, I'm gonna to get to art in a moment, but I just wanna say this. After my hero, Noam Chomsky, uh, to me, the really scary thing is not uh, the virus. We're gonna, we can do this with the virus. Really scary thing is Trump and the, that the takeover, of that consciousness, which always leaps into a situation like this and grabs it and takes it over, that's what's happening. This is terrifying to me. These people are crazy and they've got atomic weapons. And if you, uh, you listen to, uh, Chomsky never talks about anything else these days. He's like a hundred years old, white beard, you know, and he's just on it, on that thing. Uh, he doesn't even talk about the virus. And I understand that. And really, I'm afraid, if I, if, if I have fear now, it's not the virus. It's this political situation we're in. It's just incredible. I mean, you know, you watch your television on one hand, here's, you know, corpses being rolled around. The next shot is Trump coming out of the White House. My God. I mean, Shakespeare couldn't invent anything like this. Um, so where was that? Oh yeah, art. Well, hey. Art does what it always has done. It, it enlarges our, I won't say vocabulary because it's visual, it's all kinds of things, but it reflects us back onto ourselves in the deepest possible way. It, our spirit, our humanity, our fears and desires. They're just, I mean, if, with, if we didn't have art now, it would, why live, you know? I mean, this, if there ever was a time in which we need artistic vision, the artistic uh, heart. This is it. 
And I have no doubt that uh, major, major historically significant art is coming out of this thing. There's just simply, no, it's got to, I mean, there's no doubt about it. It's a situation like this that inspire great artists. And you're gonna get great art out of this. What, is, what form is that great art gonna be? I don't know. Is it gonna be paintings? I, I don't know, is it gonna be something that happens on the internet? Probably all of the above. Uh, you know, th these are big generalities, man. I, you, we're in a situation now where you can't, it's not possible to talk kind of granular. You know, it's just simply, it's too big. It's too huge, it overwhelms us. And I wanna say something, uh, <clears throat> uh, right. Wait, I have to think if I want to say this. Art, art, okay, art is going to address our fears and our desires. Now, what is the desire? We want to live. What is our fear? We might not. Anyone, you know, there are people, people you know, especially men, you know, say, be macho. Hey, I'm fearless. The government, the, 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 the oppressors say, uh, you know, Real men are fearless, you know, well, bullshit. If you're not afraid, you're not a warrior. And so artists have to address the role of fear in our lives today, how to turn that around, not get rid of it, but use it, use our fear to make statements, whether those statements are verbal, visual, music, what the hell, that address our fear in the face, <clears throat> in the face of this thing that we that's in front of us that we don't even how don't even how to describe, you know, it's beyond it's beyond words. So this is a time when huge great art is absolutely coming. I have no doubt about it. I would be that would kill me if it didn't, <laughs> you know. And it's, and and no doubt it's coming from the new media. I, I have no doubt. I think maybe the greatest thing art it's very possible that it would come from the kind of media world that, that Barry and Michael and Wright, all those people are, are championing for the, the new world that's emerging. It's, it's thrilling, this is thrilling. Yeah, and on this, I think, I mean, there are a couple of just things from the book, and this is just from the preface of the book on this particular topic, and I'm just gonna read some very short things. Um, one of them is, you know, when we say expanded cinema, we really mean expanded consciousness. Like, how do you expand the sense of consciousness? It's not just cinema. It doesn't just mean a sort of film thing in, in this context. Um, the process of becoming man's ongoing historical drive to manifest his consciousness outside his mind in front of his eyes, you know, I think is one of the important concepts here to, to how art helps us work through these things. Um, the socioeconomic system that substitutes the profit motive for use value separates man from himself and art from life which yeah. i think is extremely um critical to recognize in the situation we're in where it's like what's every you know everybody's back in their own homes and what do we do we we, we start working from home you know everybody's kind of working more than ever and this how capitalism plays into where we're at in the current moment and like what are we doing, are, are we creatively working in an expanded cinema direction or are we working in an entertainment direction um, in, a, in an escape? Are we engaging or are we escaping with our media? Yeah, probably both. It's always both. It's always both. <laughs> Qu question is, which one comes out on top? Uh, I, I had a thought here. I had a kind of a thought. Uh, oh yeah, I just want to point this out. The term avant-garde, if you go back, whenever, the 20s or whatever, when avant-garde came into the language, uh, probably 19th century for sure. Um, note, please notice that in all of the notions of avant-garde, the merging of art with life is central to them. I can't think of one avant-garde uh, practice or stream or whatever you want to call it that does not on some level either explicitly or implicitly invoke the merging of art with life getting away from the the precious product make, getting out of the gallery all that stuff and so you know if there ever was a time 
for which you're going to see great, great avant-garde. These days, art isn't just art is irrelevant. It is if it is not merged with life now on a major scale. I think that's what you're just saying, Barry. Yeah. And the, maybe the last one here, if, if there are any questions, um, either shoot them in on the chat or anything and we, we can we can ask them now. But um, one of, and remember, this was written in 1970 the, from the end of the well, from the just the first section after the preface, the, the audience and myth of entertainment is uh, the human condition as this millennium draws to a close is one of decreasing intervals between increasing emergencies until nothing but emergency exists. <laughs> and, and I can't think of anything more, you know, you were talking about Vietnam earlier, but if you look at some of the people, uh, some of the generations that have grew up now, just in their lifetime, they've had 9-11, two stock market crashes, a global pandemic, you know, like the, the state of emergency now just seems to be unbelievable. And, that that trend you could identify even you know at that time is pretty yeah. actually when i reread i hadn't read that book in 20 years <laughs> when i did i found that one you know and, oh my god <laughs> <laughs> but, but uh that's why i so much wish that i could be close to the young people today but well, you are they're all here great <laughs> <laughs> Well, I mean, what I mean is like when I was teaching and we could just have these long talks in class, you know, but, uh, but uh, because no young generation, I think, I don't know, this is pretty, has ever entered a world like this. And it's just, I just would love to know what, what these young people are feeling and thinking and what they are going to do about it. And so in my work, these days, I'm trying to propose the only thing I know, coming from who I am and my background, this thing called secession from the broadcast, leave the culture without leaving the country. We are the broadcast. We carry the culture. The poison is in us. Leave yourself. Build technologies of the self that enable you to do that, to change your mind, right? And the, the government, you know, the dominators are terrified that we're going to change our minds when you understand that phrase, change your mind in the deepest possible way. That's, that, that's the, talking about media, new media, it's all about mind control. It is, you know, at that level of, of, of countries and social organizations, that's what it's about. So anyway, uh, yeah, it's, uh, <laughs> totally breathtaking and it may very well take our breath away. All right, well, I think that should about do it for the first <laughs> session. <laughs> We're not doing too bad, I guess. Um, there's a lot more discussion to come, so we can kind of dig into all of these things more. I um, love it. I don't know who we're going to have for the discussion at the end of next week, but it, hopefully it won't be me. Um, and the discussion will keep going on on the chat server in the uh, um, interim. Um, I don't, I didn't see any questions fed to me and I don't know if that's a limitation of our logistics and procedure now or if nobody has them. So if, if anybody has a question, they can like wave or something and I'll try and look for it. But, um, oh, we got one. All right, now let me see if I can, Gustavo has a question. I think I've unmuted you. You're unmuted now, Gustavo. Uh, oh, thank you very much. Thank you, Gene. Um, and thank you, Gray Area, for the, for the wonderful program. I really, really enjoyed it. Um, uh, one question. I have uh, um, my advisor in my dissertation is here also, so he might chime in, Professor Marco Stovak from the MAT department. Uh, um, but how does the role of now with social distancing and uh, virtual reality, how does this new um, uh, barrier to communication and embodiment, how do you see that playing out now with the role of government and I would say corporations controlling the, the mechanisms of communication? 
what should artists do now with these new tools to, to I guess, to come together? Uh, I don't actually understand the question, Gustavo, uh, because this causes a cognitive dissonance in me. I mean, we're all, we are more connected than ever in the history of the world. Just because you've got to stand six feet at the, the supermarket, so what? I could care less. You know, they deliver to our house anyway. And I do understand that there are many people who can't, don't have that luxury, and that's, that's serious. But to me, those are just two entirely different universes. I mean, we are so connected now that... Well, one of the interesting things to me about this um, coronavirus situation, though, was that uh, time is still distant, I guess. You know, even in this most connected place we've ever been in the world, and, you know, we could see in December in Wuhan what was happening. I mean, there was no question. If you talk to anybody, we're connected. The information should be free and flowing as fast as it's ever flowed before. But there was still this time delay as, of months as this thing, you know, swept the globe. And even when you look at like, you know, fuller anticipatory design science like this, we failed to be anticipatory or at least, I mean, maybe you can chalk it up to a failure, like a inept leadership potentially. That's one answer but maybe maybe that's it but you know we just don't seem to be able to get ahead of the curve on this stuff yeah i uh, I, 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 I it's like why okay we're we're connected we're all in the zoom fine the information's flowing but like what's the it doesn't seem to have led to the kind of effects that we want where we can like have anticipatory design science yeah well, it's too late and I, I, I must object, it's, I, I do not use the word we today. It's, 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 I'm going to put Trump in quotes. It's not only him personally, it's everything that he represents. It's the, that kind of politics and world system. If, if it weren't for that, we, the people, would have done this thing long ago. There's no, there cannot be doubt in any of our minds. You know it, right? We, we would have done this. We, right? Not those people. In my mind, they, they are the very embodiment of evil, and I, I'm, I'm afraid of them. They're, look what they've done. The man has murdered thousands of people and says it's really cool, you know. So, uh, that, so the connection that we have now, if there ever was a time in which we the people need to use this awesome technology of connection to change our minds, We'll never have another chance. This is it. Well, on that note of optimism. <laughs> on that cheerful note, yeah. <laughs> hopefully we find some paths out of this. Hey, yeah, but hey. Earlier. You know, you can still be happy. I'm happy. Because yeah. enjoy life. What is life? It's you. Enjoy your life. You know, you have the choice. I, I'm, I'm happy all the time in that way. You know, if I think about the horrors, yeah, it's terrible. But I have certain joy in my life, a lot of it coming from Jane. And we all have that, right? Every one of us has that. We just use it. We need it now. Enjoy life. You are your life. Enjoy your life. You're never enjoying the world. You're enjoying the world that's in you. All right. Until next week. Bye, everybody. This is cool. I really look forward to it. Thanks, everybody. Bye, Jane. Goodbye. Bye. <laughs>